we explore a very important issue for how do we take a uh, beautiful intention we have with our products and also imbue a culture in our organizations that brings the best of each person on the team forward. And so we're going to explore what are the elements and aspects of authentic leadership, how does it impact the performance inside of an organization, and hopefully we're going to give you some tools that will inspire you to take this further in your own organizations and um, make a, an even bigger impact in what you're doing. So uh, I wanted to start with you, John. Um, John has a, a personal passion for this issue, and as Stephen was just mentioning, he's now uh, running a company that is inside of an enormous company in the food world, and there are some different value sets from, I think, all of us looking from the outside in, we would say, wow, there's a big difference between Annie's Inc. as a culture and General Mills as an overall culture. So John, as you are taking your company in, can you say a little bit about how you've instilled a kind of um, camaraderie and creative structure inside of Annie's, and what is it like stepping into this enormous company and maintaining the integrity of what you guys have put into play? So the most important thing I'd say is that we've, so I've been with Andy for about 15 years, a very small company in Wakefield, Massachusetts when I got there. Um, we've always focused on education and culture values. So um, one of the reasons why I think there's a lot of authentic leadership in companies like this is because um, if you have a North Star, and you, and, and you know you're focused on that, you can lead through adversity and you can lead through success. Um, and people respond to that you know, at the human level. Now, we're, we have a very strong culture at Annie's. Um, we built it, we're very proud of it. It's very integrated into the brand. So the brand and the culture are one. So my, my view is um, we have a wonderful opportunity um, at General Mills to really impact and influence where they're headed. And, um, you know, these big food companies that people like to be critical of are a part of a big system that, that has been around for a long time. So the people that are at General Mills, you know, today, they, are, they didn't create the system. They're right. part of it, right? So, but there's, there's an awareness now across the food space that there needs to be change. And a part of it is, is being authentic and honest with them about what I think those things are. And, Annie's is not compromising anything we're doing. I'm not compromising any of my principles in communicating, and I think I'm, I'm looking forward to have the opportunity to really advance the ball there. And there's a lot of people who are really excited about that. Now, change is difficult, um, and, it's, and it's controversial, but you know, if you have courage, you can make change. And I think being, just being authentic about that and honest about that actually opens the door for change. Excellent. So I appreciate the um, courageousness that you're displaying um, in taking the next step forward with, with the Andes inside of General Mills. And what I would like to do um, is just have a quick definition so we're all kind of operating with a similar understanding of authentic leadership. And Hunter, who is um, a friend and ally and um, a person I have incredible regard for, she has been stomping around the planet, shaking the sustainability flag for many, many, many years. And when we were talking about this program, she's like, well, authentic leadership is absolutely imbued in sustainability. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about how those two relate and if you can give us kind of a working definition today of authentic leadership. Well, I'll give it a go. <laughs> we're in trouble. You all know that. The, the planet as we know it is at risk to the point that there, there even now are groups saying that humans go extinct by 2050. Let that one sink in for a minute. With some science behind them, the best scientists I know say, well, business as usual, it won't be that quick. But business as usual, that's where we're headed. So business has to change. <coughs> It's, it's going to change. The definition of unsustainable is that it's going to stop. It's going to stop. The, the, the way in which we do business today is going to stop. 
We exist, humans exist, life on this planet exists. And we like to think it's because of our big brain. It exists <laughs> because of six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. It exists because of food, because of life in the soil. It all starts there. And so real leadership, particularly in this industry, cannot be divorced from fundamental sustainability, the capacity to regenerate the soil and the living systems in the soil and all of life that comes from that soil. I've had the honor to work with a number of leaders. My dad helped mentor Cesar Chavez and Martin King. How many of you have seen the movie Selma? Come on, guys, you gotta go see that movie. <laughs> Martin King was a true leader. And in the movie, the movie rightly portrays the moments in which he was unsure. And the arguments amongst the Southern Christian leadership leadership, and the decisions to go ahead or not go ahead, and the criticism that he got. Leadership is never easy. My definition of leadership anymore, and I've heard this now from a number of the CEOs I most respect, is on a particular issue. This is the right thing to do, so we're going to do it. I have no earthly idea how. Ray Anderson, who many of you will remember uh, ran Interface Carpets, said that many times. Okay, we're going to make carpet out of corn. And I said, Ray, you realize you're now in the business of sustainable agriculture. He laid his head on the desk. He said, is there never an end? <laughs> but then he turned to Mike Bartolucci, his director of research, and said, no, that's what it means to be sustainable. He said, Mike, figure it out. What is sustainable agriculture? And how can we grow corn sustainably so that we can make a sustainable carpet? The, again, the best CEOs with whom I work, Case Krithoff at Unilever, said this a uh, month or so ago. He said, we're going to go 100% renewably powered by 2020. How do we do that? And his poor sustainability staff, who are running full bore, trying to keep up with Case, said, well, we think we have it handled. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. And Case said, regenerative. That's different than sustainable. That's more than sustainable. Think about it. Sustainability is just getting your nose above water. It's the ability to go on. It's an essential step from where we are now, which, if you will, is in the mud. And we're climbing a ladder up out of the muck through all of the measures that all of us are engaged in. And every one of them is core, is fundamental. You take any of them away, you slip that further down in the muck. But you get to sustainable, you, that's just the ability to, to endure, to go on. Where we need to be going to is a system that is regenerative of all forms of human and natural capital, particularly of soil. And Case said, shouldn't Unilever's goal be to be a regenerative company? And poor uh, Jesse and, and Jonathan, the staff, were like, what? We're, we're working hard to get this sustainable. <laughs> but that's leadership, is getting out ahead of what you know how to do. Because you know that that place is the right place to go. Just pause for a moment. That's a lot of uh, intense, powerful <laughs> information, and it's it's true. I mean, we all know that things are um, spinning at a at a rate that are concerning. It's worrying. We never really know exactly how to uh, address it. But I think the thing that you just said, Hunter, that is really uh, makes it workable within each of our own spheres of activity is to choose that place where you know you're going to go beyond what you're currently doing in a direction that you know is a regenerative choice, that is going to be an impact choice. And if we each are making those kinds of choices collectively, we really can start to move the dial. That's the beauty of it. No one of us has to solve the problem. But if we're each part of a solution-oriented way of doing what we do, 
we are uh, a great team together. Well, and realizing that what each one of us does is part of this larger ecosystem. That we aren't alone and that we have to be in conversation. And that we have to be supportive of each other. The, the social change movements have always been a bucket of crabs. Any one of us starts to gain elevation, the rest of them claw down. Got to quit that. <laughs> Hashtag bucket of crap. Hashtag. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, I like that. Hashtag. <laughs> That's a hot, hot level trend. Go for it. <laughs> Ask us what that means. Um, Errol, thank you so much for being here today. So one of the, I'm so excited to have Errol in this conversation because looking at Errol's career inside of Whole Foods, he is a product of a culture that really cultivates leadership and talent inside of the company at Whole Foods Market. I think that's something all of us admire about the culture of Whole Foods. So I am delighted to have you here to sort of speak to someone who's literally been at Whole Foods for 18 years. Um, I'm not certain where you began, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about how it began for you, and then if you can also express some of the um, opportunities within the Whole Foods culture that have really served to cultivate your journey. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's actually just 13 years of Whole Foods. Oh, 13 but, uh, years old. I started at a food co-op exactly 20 years ago this year, um, which is, was a reaction to uh, paying my way through school working at food service um, and hating it, <coughs> hating the food, hating the, you know, just culture of the people, it was just, it sucked. So there was a, a campus food co-op and they were selling, you know, Amy, Amy's burritos and uh, rice cream and or, you know, organic broccoli that was grown by some local farmers. I, it was in upstate New York and I was like, oh, this is cool, I'm gonna start hanging out here. And I, you know, more or less never left. Right? So um, I started out at Whole Foods stocking shelves and um, you know, just running grocery teams and uh, just uh, stuck around because I realized that one, I was shopping there, and I was uh, raising kids and wanting them to eat that stuff. Uh, I grew up on McDonald's and iceberg lettuce, and uh, wanted them to be organic food. And I realized that the best way to, to do that was to make sure I was selling it. And I could directly influence what we were selling as a company. And I was also attracted to Whole Foods has core values. Uh, you know, talking about uh, supporting their communities and the environment that they're in. Um, team members, like keeping them happy, but also do an excellent job, and then um, supplier partnerships, like making sure that we are partnering with the folks that we do business with so that it's mutually beneficial, it's not parasitic. Um, and you know, I think the other big motivation for me is that I had a real dislike and distrust of uh, mainstream business. I really had no desire to go work for a mainstream food company, and I just kept meeting all these musicians and artists and dudes with full sleeve tattoos and piercings, and uh, I was like, well, I'm home. <laughs> um, you know, like guys on my team, I was going up, you know, hardcore punk shows with after work and talking about comic books. And um, you know, we we are our own customers, and that's what I like about Whole Foods. We, we we're, we're part of the sort of subculture and counterculture. But we're also <coughs> taking it real mainstream. And I really, it's a big struggle for us now. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. But I think the main thing with Whole Foods uh, is it, it encourages leadership, it encourages innovation, it encourages us to take uh, risks, perhaps somewhat calculated risks. And in my own career trajectory, you know, we've taken some really big risks. Um, we uh, were the first national retail to really go after the Muslim community in terms of a customer base and partnered with uh, some suppliers to launch uh, Halal Foods and to start talking about Ramadan in the same way we talk about Hanukkah, and Christmas, and Easter because of just demographic research to show that we were missing, everybody was missing it, you know? mm. And um, it's, been, it's been a fabulous experience, but it was pretty tough at first, because we had to convince folks internally and then deal with uh, some really nasty bloggers and, and uh, you know, people complaining about it. And I was like, well, you know, if you don't like the food, don't buy it. But the uh, feedback from the Muslim community was fabulous. It's a great growth trend for us. Concurrently, we did a ton of kosher. We helped transform the kosher industry by having organic foods, gluten-free, quinoa, biodynamic, and kosher foods. And I grew up uh, secular Jewish. Kosher food is awful. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make it not awful. <laughs> and then finally, our you know 
the big, the biggest one that we've really worked on, which we're still like neck deep in, is our GMO transparency commitment. And why the hell it's taken us five years to, uh, to you know, label GMOs? And I could tell you, uh, it's probably the most difficult thing we've ever had to do because the whole supply chain is 95% GMO. Right. And so when we're looking at organic and then conventional non-GMO on a lot of commodities, a lot of crops, you're talking about fighting for that other five or six percent and how to do it. So uh, there's a huge disconnect between what the consumers want and what our farmers are doing in this country. We need to make sure there's a better understanding of the market demand. You know, I think the, the great impetus for us is the amount of competition we have for organic right now. And, um, you know, I, like we like to say we welcome other folks to the party. You know, other retailers, other suppliers, but we really need to see it as a potluck. Because folks got to start bringing supply with them. They got to start bringing their own meals with them mm. when they're coming to this party or else we're not going to have enough. Um, and just tying it back to Whole Foods, and we get a lot of encouragement from our leadership on this sort of stuff. It's got to make sense financially. Ultimately, I'm responsible for <laughs> company sales and margins. So if the numbers don't make sense, then you know, no, nothing else that I say does. Right. So um, I think all this is really core to our business. And we see that we're a leader in this, and other folks are following along. Really, what we're calling the natural food industry, in, you know, maybe a decade if we last that long, is uh, going to be called the food industry. Mm -hmm. and I don't think we really have. But well, it has to be, or we won't last very much. <coughs> you know, we had a we had a talk. Uh, Tom Newmark, uh, new chapter, came and gave a talk to 75 our grocery personnel this week on uh, carbon sequestration, you know, putting the carbon underground. And one of my team members, uh, Dave Lafferty, broached the subject with one of our organic suppliers. He said, "But are you putting the carbon underground?" <laughs> and so like we, we want to be taking you know that sort of wisdom that the industry and you know, NGOs and researchers and adapt it to our, our business model. We got to make it part of the conversation with our suppliers. And, uh, and once again, like, I work for a company that, that encourages that sort of behavior. Right. Well, that's, that's exciting. And on the uh, carbon sequestration, I mean, we have the solution with organic agriculture. What's so powerful about that is that it does retain more carbon than conventional because back to Hunter's point, the soil is alive and has organisms that actually pull the carbon out of the air and hold it in the soil. So we really are part of the solution on a very enormous level if we're um, really focusing on increasing organic agriculture. In well, the we United have parts of it. Organic agriculture is key. Holistic management of grazing animals, the work of Alan Savory, is key. The, your supply chains, where is the carbon in your supply chains? Do you know? And if you are not managing the carbon of your supply chains, you're not being responsible. And there, there are a lot of us who can help you figure out how to do that. Supply chain management used to simply be about least cost. How do you meet your margins? And now it's moving into risk management. What is in your supply chain that some consumer could jump up and nail you on? And is your supply chain clean, fair trade? Does it treat people well? The Guardian piece, uh, what, last spring on shrimp farming in Thailand, human trafficking, slavery. Now we're starting to have laws here in California on human trafficking. Do you have human trafficking, child labor, animal mistreatment anywhere in your supply chain? You need to know your supply chain from a risk management standpoint, but more importantly, the companies that are looking to their supply chain as a way of generating greater value for the company because they're doing the right thing, are going to be the next billion dollar companies. Take Chipotle. They stopped selling pork carnitas because they couldn't assure themselves that the pork they were getting came from animals that were treated humanely. So they stopped selling it. They went around, they sourced it from Nyman. It took the product from their least expensive on the menu to their most expensive, and sales doubled. They did this because it was the right thing to do. Not because it was the least cost, not even as a risk management strategy. They were committed to doing the right thing. Let me just jump in there. It actually is more expensive to source non-GMO and organic than conventional. You know, there is more of a, a, a market 
a, a true free market when you're talking about organic. Non-GMO is not even really calculated in, in commodity uh, futures trading. Yet we all know about the farm bill and we all know about farm subsidies for, for commodity crops that ultimately go into high fructose corn syrup and uh, you know, distillers grains and you know, all, all, all the ethanol. So when you're actually taking a sustainability approach, you're actually, unfortunately at this point, raising your costs. You've got to figure out how to mitigate that so that you're, you know, for us, being competitive with other retailers who are 80, 90, 99% locked into the industrial farming and GMO right. agriculture, it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. So what we're actually trying to bet on is our customers will support it. That they, that's what they want. And so that we have to manage our margins in a way that keeps customers focused on organic products and non-GMO products. And you know, obviously customer education and outreach is a huge opportunity <laughs> for us. Um, and so as these trends grow, it, it's helpful to us because you know we need the supply to come out because ultimately that's going to help us on our costs. Well, this and is that's often... not taking into account all the externalities right. that don't go into the actual cost of uh, you know conventional corn or or, uh, or other industrial products that most retailers don't have to pay for. Right. When they're cutting the PO. Well, this is authentic leadership. You know these things that we're talking about. You know. Are, that, that is the kind of the actual actionable aspects of what authentic leader looks looks like in the world. John, what yeah, did no, you I was going to say I, I totally agree. And the folks that are here, and I spent, I had a little bit of time to walk the show early this morning and see some stuff. The folks that are here, the the leaders that are creating these small little companies and they're growing the bigger ones. You're you're the ones that are changing the world. And you know, um, Errol mentioned. You know, how hard it is, um, and how it's very much about the consumer. To me, we, we, have, we should be very optimistic about where we're going. And I, I agree with Hunter that there's views that say we're already dead by the middle of the century too, but the op my optimism comes from the fact that ultimately, what, what, will make, you know, what will make the food business great in the future, and what it will small companies impacting big companies, and big companies like Unilever, who's incredible in the area of sustainability, like the stuff that they're doing is amazing. And um, a couple decades ago, you would have never, never guessed that. Never so, dreamed. so to me, that, that's how you change the system, and it takes true leadership. Somebody at the top of a big company like that to say, I don't care what it costs, this is the right thing. And little companies make those decisions all the time. In the mid 00s, we moved all of our stuff to organic. We, we couldn't afford it. We, our, our bottom line went from a million to zero on that one move, but it was the right thing. And, and um, so I think, I think that's what it's about. It's having a North Star and following it. And that's how you're going to change the world. Well, Paul Coleman of Unilever, uh, shortly after he ascended to the CEO ship, announced he wasn't going to report quarterly. Uh, stock dropped 10%. He said, to those of you who have sold, I respect you as human beings, but if you believe that I will enhance the value of the company that you, in theory, own by managing on a 90-day rotation, I thank you, I don't want you as my owners. Tim Cook recent, of Apple recently said the same thing. Those of you who think uh, climate doesn't exist, climate change doesn't exist, I don't want you as my owners. Go own some other company. Apple's going 100% renewable. In Paul's case, stock has gone soaring up. But at the time, the Wall Street analyst said, oh, he's going to get dumped. He said, they just hired me. I didn't think they'd fire me immediately. But that was a huge risk. And how many other companies have followed Unilever and announced they're not going to report quarterly? I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Zero. Paul is still standing out there, Paul. And so you know, the, 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 the few great leaders, the, the real leaders, your big boss, had a brilliant article in Reason Magazine, what, uh, eight, some years ago, a uh, debate with Milton Friedman. Friedman said, I will show you corporate, social, corporate social responsibility. It is to deliver value to owners, full stop. Matthew said, I'm a businessman, a rather successful one, and that's not the only reason I'm in business. Why are you in business? Ask yourselves that. 
Why are you in business? Most entrepreneurs love business. They love creating little companies. They love the art of the deal. They love the relationships. They have to make money. That's one of the realities. You gotta meet your margins. But that's not why you're in business. And yet we let that, okay, we gotta make money, drive how we make decisions. That's not leadership. That's bad followership. We need more leaders. So if we're looking at the, you know, I wanna kind of dial it into the personal, um, as individuals, you know, how do we find our own voice as an authentic leader? And what I'd like is for each of you to speak to that point very specifically as individuals. <coughs> How has, within Annie's, how have you um, seen a, an internal culture that is creating a space that helps an individual kind of find their own voice and support the emergence of that voice? And each of you, if you would comment on that aspect for, you know, I am inside of an organization. I don't even have to be the leader. It, the, the, it's not a C, we're not talking about C level people that are leaders. We're talking about any human being has the capacity to be an authentic leader. It's finding your true voice and bringing that forward. So could you touch on that, please? So, um, you know, to me, it, it, all, it all comes from the individual. To me, authentic leadership is that you're authentic. So you're not one person at work leading and you're not a, another person when you leave the office. I mean, it's like, I don't understand that. So actually, when I first heard the term authentic leadership, I was like, what the hell does that mean? I don't even understand. It's like, how could you not be yourself? You know, so um, at, at Annie's, um, one, well, I'll mention one thing. We, we, try to, we try to have all of our people do you feel that. And so um, years ago, I, I wrote a list it was bugging me that we were hiring people so fast. And I was like, how can I make sure that everyone gets this idea? So I put together a list of nine things that I think will help you be successful in Annie's. And if you, if you read that list and it doesn't ring with you, you shouldn't apply. Um, and we just kept printing that email and putting it into everybody's startup packet. Um, and you can see it on my, on my LinkedIn page. You can see it. I actually shared it a while back. But it's stuff like don't be an a-hole. Um, you know, um, be respectful, that doesn't mean you have to agree. Um, it's be yourself, it's, uh, it's lead, it's uh, you know, jump for the ball, dive for the ball. It's, it's just basic, basic things about how to be a good human being and to help us go to our North Star. And if you, if you can do that, that's, you're gonna be an authentic employee and you're gonna be very successful in our culture, which is striving to be authentic. We are not perfect. That's the other thing about authentic leadership is admitting that you're not perfect. We're not perfect. We try, we try to do things in the sustainability area. Um, we have a great director of sustainability, Sean Stowski. We talk about it all the time. It's like, we, we, we get, we'll get better, and you can't congratulate yourself for getting better because you suck relative to what you could be doing. <laughs> and being authentic about that is, is the reality. And so you have to be on a journey. So it's, it's that kind of communication, just letting people know that that's important as a leader, to me, is what makes a culture um, accept that. Thank you. Hemingway said, everything is your fault if you're any damn good. <laughs> I've never had a job. Uh, you know, that's not true. One summer I was a waitress. I sucked. Oh my god. <laughs> I would not want you as my waitress. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, get your own head, Poppy. <laughs> I've always invented organizations. Uh, sometimes out of necessity, I used to run a, a big outfit. Uh, we had, I don't know, 75 staff. And one day I got fired. I had a uh, very long story, better told over whiskey, but I uh, brought in the biggest contract in the history of the organization, thereby making the executive director look very bad. And a week and a half later got fired. I had just brought on a uh, businessman. We were a little nonprofit. And we knew how to be a nonprofit. We had no idea how to run a business. So I brought in a businessman. Uh, that seriously threatened the culture. And so I got fired, he got fired, having just brought him to Colorado from Paris, I felt like I owed him a living. So we looked at each other and said, well, want to go again? And created Natural Capitalism Solutions, which uh, I nominally run now. Uh, we have a guy as our CEO, because I'm never there and I'm around the world. And one summer, all of the staff came to me and said, I can't work with him, one by one by one. 
And I said, okay, what do you think we ought to do? And they all said, make Toby the CEO. I said, well, that's easy. So Toby's now our CEO. He was an intern. <laughs> That's but the cool. staff loved it. I want to work for her. <laughs> <laughs> Transferred the other guy laterally. He then got a fabulous job and is happily doing that. We're still friends. But leadership isn't the title that you hold. It's what are you doing with the people and do your people love you and do you love them? And are you together creating real change? So in natural capitalism, we work with companies, communities, countries. Uh, I was asked uh, a year or so back by the king of Bhutan to reinvent the global economy. Like, me? <laughs> so I've been going around asking everybody I could lay hands on, how would you do that? Tracked into a man named John Fullerton, runs a thing called Capital Institute. He was 18 years J.P. Morgan, walked away. Found a little nonprofit to try to transform finance. John and I have just gotten a grant through the Club of Rome to take a swing at reinventing the global economy. And John uh, is an impact investor in regenerative agriculture. So we've been bringing in people from literally around the world, the best minds we can find. We're gonna meet this spring and take a run at what would be an economy in service to life. In Bucky Fuller's words, a world that works for 100% of humanity. And we will fail, I guarantee you. I have no idea what that would be. John wrote me this morning and said, we need conservatives. I said, yeah, I agree. I said, on the other hand, they kind of have their intellectual act together. They know what their, their basic value construct is. Progressives don't. What do we stand for? Can you spit it out in one sentence? Government is bad, the primacy of the individual, the market will do it all. What do we stand for? So I said to John, yes, I agree, and there's some great conservatives. I mean, I'm a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. I would love to have Teddy back. Go read Teddy Roosevelt. He's uh, on uh, popularism, or populism. He's to the left of Elizabeth Warren. That's sort of startling, yeah? How far to the right our country has drifted. But I think we need this conversation about what do we stand for? What do we believe in? What is a world that works for 100% of humanity? So watch this space. Uh, for, for any of you who want to play in that conversation, please come talk to me, because for real, we've, we've, we've taken on trying to do that, and I definitely need help. Uh, and if any of you want to know about what we do with companies, Nick Sterling, our director of research, Nick, stick your hand up, is here. And we do a lot of practical things with companies that help you with uh, cutting costs. If, you have, if your costs in one area are going up, cut your costs in another area, perhaps through your energy, perhaps through how you're managing your supply chain. But for real, we don't have much time. Sylvia Earle, the great oceanographer, said what we do in the next 10 years matters more than what humanity does in the next 10,000. So uh, thanks to all of you for coming and being here and being part of this conversation. But uh, do one thing. What's your dot? Do one thing every day. Errol, how would you touch on the bringing it into the individual leadership cultivation? Well, uh, you know, I was a grocery schlep, just you know, doing the retail grind now for so long. Like, you got to keep it, you know, on the ground level. You got to be able to talk to people at where they're at. And I think, um, you know, Whole Foods has a way of keeping all of us humble and, um, you know, pretty basic about what we're trying to achieve. You know, we're all accountable for certain. You know, financial, but also for you know the culture, you know, and the mission, and purpose of what we're trying to do. So um, we spend a lot of time just talking to our team members and helping them understand what we're doing, and also understanding what they have to go through on a daily basis. Just making sure that you know we're real down to earth about all the stuff we're talking about, that they can relate to it, understand it, and then ultimately sell it to our customers. So it really doesn't matter. You know, my team is doing all this real high food and sustainability work. If a team member who's stocking shelves 
uh, can't explain it to you, a customer who's wanted to put it in their basket. And that's obviously a huge opportunity for us, but ultimately that's where we need to be as a retailer. And um, we're encouraged, once again, to do that sort of thing through our core values. And we have teams that get together you know, on conference calls on a weekly basis. We have pretty regular meetings. Uh, we just, like I said, had a meeting this, this week where we got our personnel together. You know, that sort of human connection is ultimately for us the way, it's the how we're going to be able to do this uh, sort of resilient agricultural work, this post-sustainability, you know. Um, <coughs> folks have to understand it on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, you know, during Tom's talk, our teams were scribbling furiously notes. And, like, they're all asking me now, like, what do we do? How do we, how do we talk about this? It's like, well, that's what we now have to figure out is, is the how. But... Keeping it, you know, you know, just keeping it real for our team members is ultimately for us. And then, you know, helping them in advance, helping them as we're growing. We're opening 40 stores this year, 40 stores next year. And uh, we're all real excited about it. We're all really exhausted from it. But that just means there's a lot of opportunities for folks to move up. And what are we looking for when we're talking to team members? Is that level of humility, that, you know, the empathy. You know, that's one of the most important traits for a leader in our company. Um, and somebody who's creative, passionate, inspired. We're not just looking for someone who can manage their bottom line. There's so much more to it. You know, and by keeping it at that level, we can continue and really strengthen the conversation about agriculture. Because that's, I mean, that's we're rooted in it. You know, uh, one in three foods that we sell is, is pollinated by, by honeybees. You know, it's, um, I think that's some, in some categories it's 70 or 80 percent. You know, and so when we're talking about pollinators, we, we've done two, uh, you know, sort of media stunts in the last couple of years. One where we removed a bunch of products from the produce section, showed before and after, right. pollinators with, pollinators without, and then we did one in our dairy section in the Linfield, which by the way has a rooftop garden. And we uh, took all the pollinated foods out of a dairy section, and it was stark. It was stark. And that and that's how we're able to talk to team members about That's why we're doing all this work on pollinators. That's why we're pushing organics. That's why we're trying to talk to more of our suppliers about their supply chain. So, um, that's what we're, we're hoping to achieve. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, I also want to open it up to you. Part of the, at the Epicenter structure is we want to have an engaged process. Not only are we engaging with one another, but we welcome you to engage. So um, please know now you are welcome to raise your hand and ask a question. So who would like to break the ice? Yes, ma'am. So the question is like, what sustains you as a leader? How do you maintain a certain kind of focus when there are so many demands on your time? And what what is sort of the driver for each? How do you maintain that focus on your North Star, staying authentic inside of all of the things pulling on you? Do you want to address that, John? Yeah, I think um, 
you know, what's, what sustains me is that, that I, I think I can make a difference. You know, and, and the industry we're in is, is a beautiful industry in that regard. You can build a, a successful business. You know, you can, you can deliver returns to shareholders like Whole Foods has done better than practically any company in the history of the NASDAQ, but they can also change the world. Like, it's amazing the power, the power of conscious capitalism, like, focused in the right direction is so amazing. And, and to just be a part of that and have to be able to play a small role in that is, like, sustains me through the hard times. You gotta take care of yourself. I've learned that the hard way. Last Expo S, I threw my back out. You know, I couldn't walk for a week. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't work. I mean, what's 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 the use? You know, if you work so hard that you're you're you're, you're laid up. That's I've learned to just take time out to do things I like. You know, I got kids. I'm doing this for them. Um, but I also I got a garden. I'm a budding permaculturist. Permaculturist. So we have chickens. Um, I exercise. I. Take advantage of all these great foods that we're bringing to market by eating them. 